Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. This is now session 20. Uh, as I mentioned at the end of last session, uh, we're going to deviate a little bit this week from the actual text of the Book of Revelation. We're still sticking within uh, the theme of the issues that we're, that we're touching on. But the reason I wanted to deviate is because in last, uh, last week's session, we looked at the sixth seal. Okay, now the sixth seal is clearly the cosmic signs, the sun going dark, the moon turning red, the great earthquake, and this type of thing, the signs that signal the day of the Lord. But specifically, when we look at Matthew 24, when we look at the Olivet Discourse, when we look at Jesus' words, when he talks about those specific cosmic signs, he says, first you'll see those things, and then he says, and then you will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And so I want to take some time this week. I think this is, uh, personally, I think it's super cool, and I think you all will uh, find it to be a real treat as well. But I want to discuss this issue. What exactly is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? Now, a lot of people, when they read Matthew 24, they'll simply say, well, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is the cosmic signs, the sun going dark, the moon turning blood, uh, blood red. Um, but the way that Jesus words it, it's actually something distinct. It's something else. Okay, so we're going to discuss this specific issue. What is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? Now, before we jump in, I, uh, I want to share a little bit of the backstory. And for what it's worth, I have a whole chapter on this. It's the last appendix in my book, Sinai to Zion, um, which, by the way, I did finally get word back from the, uh, the publishers. They're going to deliver that May 24th. So all of the printers are all delayed, supposedly because of paper shortages, because of COVID. Apparently the toilet paper thing is still impacting the paper industry. I don't know, but May 24th. But um, as I said, we've got uh, an appendix at the back of the book, Sinai Design, where we deal with this. Now I tell the story, and I always want to tell the backstory because I don't want to take credit for what I'm about to teach. It really was, a, so I, I think, a revelation that a friend of mine had as he was studying the scriptures. Uh, his name is Stephen Holmes, good friend. Last summer, uh, in the midst of COVID, I took my son out and um, him and another friend, Steve Willis, and we did some uh, camping out in Colorado uh, with the kids. And so at night, the kids are in the tent sleeping and we're sitting around the campfire. And of course, we start talking Bible. And Stephen says, okay, I think I figured out what the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is. Now, for what it's worth, this is the kind of lead into a conversation that immediately I become leery of. Um, when someone says, I think I figured out, you know, some sort of eternal mystery. I think I, I, think I figured it out. Um, because being who I am, for what it's worth, I constantly get all kinds of emails and different things like that where people have figured out some deep mystery and you know, what the particular mystery that one particular individual figures out is completely contradictory to what the Holy Spirit clearly spoke to this other person, you know, that type of thing. And so it's easy to sort of, when you get bombarded with this much stuff, it's easy to, you know, become a little bit, um, you, you've got your, your walls up, so to speak. But Stephen is a good friend. Um, he and I do uh, talk about what the Lord is showing us in the scriptures frequently. And so I do trust, you know, what, what he had to say. So he kind of laid it out. And when he laid it out, I just went, it was kind of one of these like, duh, like, yeah, that absolutely completely makes sense. Like, I'm amazed that no one has ever talked about this before. And I said, and this actually fits so perfectly with my book, Sinai to Zion, that I was just finishing up, just sending to the printers for the first uh, edition, that I actually said, stop the printers. And um, I said, let's actually add this as an appendix in the book because it just fits so perfectly. In, in so many ways, it was sort of the, the cherry on top uh, at the end of um, this discussion about the return of Jesus. So I want to give Stephen credit. This was something that he, you know, he, I, he felt as though the Lord sort of opened this up to him as he was studying. And um, when I looked at it, I went, this absolutely makes sense. Now, I say that to say uh, that it does make sense, but I'm not dogmatic. We're not like teaching doctrine. This is like some official doctrine. Um, we can't know with absolute certainty. But what we're going to talk about in terms of what is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, 
as I said, it makes sense and um, in light of what the scriptures teach and in light of the backstory. Uh, you know, again, the backstory of all of the terms that are used in the New Testament when they talk about the return of Jesus. So we're going to begin with a little bit of basic backstory. Now, I've touched on this quite a few times already in the Maranatha Global Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. But this is the issue of Yahweh is the cloud rider. Okay, so again, in the New Testament, when Jesus talks about coming back on the clouds, there's some very important Old Testament backstory that any Old Testament literate Jew, again, a first century Jew, would have been familiar with. Okay, these were common ideas. These are common um, motifs that would have been understood by the Jews in the first century. And so the first text that sort of addresses this issue of Yahweh as the cloud rider is Deuteronomy 33, verse 26. Now again, Deuteronomy 33 is the blessing of Moses. It's a profound prophecy that Moses gives. Um, it uses the language of Yahweh or Yehovah coming down on Mount Sinai. The great theophany at Sinai, again, when Torah was given to Moses and to the Israelites when the covenant was made. But toward the end of uh, chapter 33, um, the Lord through Moses says this, There is none like the God of Jeshurun. Now, Jeshurun is a reference to Israel. It's a pet name for Israel. It means my upright ones. So the statement is saying this, essentially, There is no one like the God of Israel. There's no God out there like the God of Israel. And then it defines him this way, who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. So Yahweh is defined specifically as the one who rides upon the clouds. Now there's some historical backstory here as well, because as the Jews were, you know, leaving Egypt through the Exodus, and they're making their way up through modern-day Jordan, Edom, Moab, and so forth, around the Dead Sea um, into the Promised Land. As they are entering the Promised Land, the Canaanites that lived in the land, they worshipped Baal. Baal was known as the storm god. He was actually referred to as the cloud rider, the one who rides on the clouds. And so the Israelites, you think about this, the Israelites are like, Psst, Baal is not the cloud rider, right? This is all talk. Sorry, guys, but you've never seen Baal. You've never seen him riding on the clouds. We, on the other hand, we did see Yehovah, Yahweh, riding on the clouds. In fact, we saw the cloud. We followed him through the desert for 40 years. We followed him out of Egypt. With our eyes, we saw God leading us. The cloud would lift the cloud. You know, it was the pillar of cloud, but they were saying that the Lord himself was in the cloud. And we're going to look at some of the scriptures that talk about that. So the Israelites were like, no, Yahweh is the cloud rider. Like we have seen him with our eyes. We followed him. He saved our lives from the onslaught of Pharaoh and his armies and this type of thing, right? So like Baal, sorry, Baal, you're not the cloud rider, our God. There's no God like the God of Israel who comes to save us and who comes on the clouds, okay? So again, it's alluding back to the Exodus, but it's a prophecy that's ultimately speaking of the return of Jesus, who is himself, Yehovah the Son, Yahweh the Son, who will come back on the clouds, the cloud rider, to fulfill the prophecy of Deuteronomy 33 and so many other prophecies. And that's why the New Testament uses all of the language of Deuteronomy 33, of God who comes from heaven with myriads of his holy, holy angels, his holy ones, lightning shooting out of his hands, riding on the clouds, coming back to save his people. That's all language that the New Testament appropriates and applies to the return of Yeshua, the return of Jesus. Uh, and there's a few other verses, but another one that we need to touch on is Psalm 68 which is this beautiful processional psalm laid out by King David. Again, I've got a whole chapter on this in my book, Sinai to Zion. But it says this, I love it. Verse 4, sing to God, sing praises to his name, exalt the one who rides on the clouds. Again, Yehovah, Yahweh, he is the one who rides on the clouds. He is the cloud rider. He's defined this way. It's actually, who is Yahweh? He is he who rides on the clouds. He is the cloud rider, for Yahweh is his name, Yehovah is his name, rejoice before him. And there's so much more that we could unpack in Psalm 68. But again, these motifs, these ideas, these concepts would have been well understood by a first century Jew who is very familiar with the Bible, with the Old Testament. All right? So now we're familiar with that. We can move on. 
The other sort of motif that, um, again, a first century Jew would have been familiar with, and we, if we want to understand the development of messianic thought, messianic prophecy, messianic revelation, as it was progressively given to God's people, we have to understand the concept of the Son of Man. This is huge. This is huge. Um, the key text, of course, is Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14. Daniel says, I continued watching in the night vision. So he's having sort of a vision, a dream, a vision. He says, and suddenly one like a son of man. He sees someone. He's, he looks like a man. He looks like a human. He has the form of a human. You know, two arms, two legs, right? Anthropomorphic form. He's not a human, but he looks like a human. He's one like a son of man. And he's coming with the clouds of heaven. So he's coming on the clouds. Again, assume, by the, again, Daniel is a post, well, he's an exilic prophet, like a prophet during the exile, but he's a later prophet, relatively speaking. So by the time that you get to Daniel, there's a lot that, again, the Jews would have understood by this time. They would have understood that when someone comes on the clouds, wait, that's Yahweh. So already Daniel goes, it's someone, he looks like a human. We know it's Yahweh, though, because he's coming on the clouds. Only Yahweh rides. There's none like the God of Jeshurun who rides on the clouds. Only the God of Israel rides on the clouds. Yahweh is the cloud rider. So whoever the Son of Man is, he's also the cloud rider. So you've got something here. You've got the Ancient of Days, and you've got this one that looks like a Son of Man. You've got an Old Testament preliminary development of the idea of what later would be, come to be understood or referred to as the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Again, you don't need to turn to the New Testament uh, for these ideas and these concepts to be biblical and clear. You have Yahweh the Son, Yahweh the Father here. It doesn't reference the Holy Spirit. There are other places in the Old Testament that do do that. So it says, the one who was coming on the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, and he was escorted before him. And he was given things that, again, only Yahweh is given. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And those of every nation, every people, every language will serve him. His dominion is everlasting. Now, again, you have to be God in order to inherit an eternal kingdom. Humans can't e inherit an eternal kingdom unless it's in the resurrection, right? I guess you could say that they would. Um, and his dominion is everlasting. It will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So we could really unpack Daniel 7, but this is where, again, in the development of messianic prophecy, it becomes clear that the promised one, the promised one that was initially introduced all the way back in Genesis 3.15, this one who's going to come, the seed of Eve, the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Israel, the seed of David, Right? He's clearly a human because he's born of people. You know, he comes forth from a human line. He's also much more than just a human. He's actually clearly identified with terms that only Yahweh fulfills. He comes from heaven. On one hand, he's born of a human. On, a, on the other hand, he comes from heaven on the clouds. Okay, so you have this concept of the Son of Man. Um, and for what it's worth, uh, I need to actually elaborate on this a little bit more. The term son of man is also used, for example, in Ezekiel. It's used in a few different places in the Old Testament. The Lord says to Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy and say this, that, and the other thing, right? That simply means human. That simply means human. Why would we suggest that the son of man here in Daniel is different? Well, what's interesting is that whether it be Ezekiel or any of these other texts where the son of man is referenced, these are Hebrew texts. Okay, so in Hebrew, the, the term would be ben adam son of Adam, son of man, okay? Here in Daniel 7, the text that we receive Daniel 7 in is Aramaic. It's not Hebrew. Aramaic, again, being a kind of a uh, dialect, a mixture between Babylonian and Hebrew. This is what they spoke after the exile. They came back, right? And so the text comes to us in Aramaic. Now, in Aramaic, son of man is not ben Adam. It's bar Anasha. And we know... Okay, we know that Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, bar Nasha, more than any other term ever, like Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, and we know that he used the Aramaic. How do we know that? Because when he was confronted by the authorities and they go, like, are all these charges true? Are you really blaspheming? 
And he goes on and he says, truly I say to you, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, essentially to judge you. And they go, we don't need to hear anything else, blasphemy. Okay, so he clearly said bar Anasha, which means he was saying, I am the one referred to in Daniel 7. He was claiming to be Yahweh Almighty, which is why they said it's blasphemy. Okay, that's, that's why he was condemned. They go, he's claiming to be Yahweh. He's claiming to be the Son of Man. He's claiming to be the cloud rider. Okay, so again, you, you piece that together. You go, oh, okay, wow, that really makes sense. I, you know, in the New Testament, you read Son of Man, you think he's just calling himself a human. No, he's not calling himself a human. He is claiming to be the cloud rider. He's claiming to be Yehovah. He's claiming to be Yahweh. <clears throat> Okay, so we've got the sort of Old Testament backstory to the cloud rider. We've got some of the Old Testament backstory to the term son of man. When the term son of man is used, when Jesus says, Matthew 16, 27, the first reference in the New Testament uh, referencing the return of Jesus, and it's Jesus talking about his own return, he says, when the son of man comes in the glory of his father with all of his angels with him. Okay, he's using all of this language. He was clearly referring to uh, Daniel 7. I'm the one that will be presented, if you will, before the Ancient of Days, Yehovah the Son. So now let's talk about this issue of the pillar. Let's talk about the pillar of cloud, the pillar of cloud and fire. Because from a Christian perspective, the, the story of Israel, the story of the Exodus, the story of the Lord leading Israel out of Egypt, and ultimately up into the Promised Land, it's an interesting historical story. But it's not front and center for, more, for most of us. And again, we acknowledge and we recognize that the book of Revelation, so much of the imagery and the language is drawn from the Exodus. The plagues that are poured out, I mean, there, there's so much, like, so much of the way it's framed, the book of Revelation is framed, it's framed from the Exodus. And if you've never heard that, this is something that scholars and commentators are widely aware of, and they point to all the different ways in which the story of the return of Jesus is framed and patterned after the Exodus. In fact, this is what my entire book, Sinai to Zion, is about, is showing the sort of connection between the Exodus, between the Theophany at Sinai, and how all of that prefigured and revealed the nature of the return of Jesus as it was described throughout the Bible, but as well as in the New Testament. Um, but for most Christians, this idea of the pillar of cloud, like it's, it's more of just a historical curiosity. But for the Jews, this is everything. Now, let me say this, and uh, hopefully I can articulate this correctly. Christians say, we believe that Jesus is going to come back because he has already been here. He came in the flesh. He was here in the first century, and he promised that he's coming back in the clouds, and therefore we believe it. Interestingly enough, Jews who are familiar with all of these Old Testament prophecies, they would say Yahweh is coming back, or yeah, they would say he's coming back. You go, wait a minute, Jews say God's coming back? Yes. They would say he already came once at Sinai. He came down at the culmination of the Exodus, the great theophany at Sinai. God has already showed up. He showed up before potentially a million or more people, like before the great multitude of those that came out of Egypt. He came down in blazing fire and smoke and earthquakes and the blasting of trumpets. He came down before the people and he spoke and they were begging Moses, please like, tell him to stop talking. This is the great, like God has never done this in history, come down before so many people visibly to where, again, they're begging, please tell him to stop. We can't bear this. We can't bear what we're seeing and experiencing. And so he came once, but he's also coming back again to save Israel. You have numerous prophecies that talk about this. Again, Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Psalm 68, Habakkuk 3, multiple times throughout Revelation. He talks about Yahweh coming in, uh, um, in Revelation, I meant Isaiah, talks about Yahweh coming in fire um, from heaven to save Israel. On and on and on in Zechariah, right? So the Jews would say God's coming back, Yahweh's coming back from heaven. He came once at Sinai and he's coming again from heaven. Christians say Jesus is coming back. He came once in the incarnation and he's coming back. And the truth is both the Jews and Christians are correct. Now Jews don't know that Yahweh coming back is also, he's going to come back as Yeshua. Uh, you know, the son of Joseph, son of Mary from Nazareth, right? Like the, this guy, this Jewish rabbi that all the crazy Gentiles have been talking about all these years. They don't, they don't make that connection. 
But Christians, on the other hand, we have all of these pictures about the return of Jesus that are not necessarily in accordance with reality. They are our very sort of Gentile, modified, popular Christianity version of his return that's not necessarily biblical. And in order to understand what it will be like when he returns, what was Jesus probably referring to when he said, then will appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? What was that a reference to? We have to first look at the issue of the pillar. The pillar was huge. It was the very sign whereby Israel, it was the, the visible, tangible evidence that Yahweh was in their midst, that Yahweh was present. How did they know that God was present to save them? They just looked right in front of them. There's the pillar. Fire at night, cloud by day, right? Now, for what it's worth, let's just talk about the shape. Um, when we think pillar, we think just this long cylindrical column type of uh, cloud or uh, structure. Well, it was that because it refers to it multiple times as a pillar, but it was probably more of a, a mushroom shaped type of thing because you have references um, in Exodus where it says that it gave them shade throughout the day during the desert out there in the desert. So in order to sh give shade to so many people, it had to be like an umbrella or a mushroom or something like this, but it was also referred to as a pillar. So that's really the only way to, now maybe it kind of morphed and changed at different times. It, it says it would go before them and in between the Israelites and, um, and Pharaoh and his armies so that Pharaoh and his armies couldn't see the Israelites. So you go, well, it had to be a pretty wide pillar as well. So there's a lot of, you know, references that you try to weed through to understand the, the structure of this thing. But I think it's safe to say that it was probably a long cylindrical column that then blossomed with an umbrella type of shape up in the clouds. And again, it was a cloud by day, fire by night. It's both. It's kind of like, you know, a flashlight beam. You know, you can't see it during the day. At night, it's very clear. It was probably, you know, a fiery type of thing all the time, but at night it really glowed. I mean, just speculating. I don't know that it changed, you know, just as the, like a, like a uh, light, um, you know, automatic light detector, you know, it notices when it goes dark and turns, like, I don't think it changed at dusk and dawn type of thing. I think it was always kind of fire and smoke and clouds, and it just looked different during the day and during the night. But again, that's just speculation. Okay, so let's begin. We're just going to look at some passages that talk about the pillar and, um, and sort of zero in on it. Exodus 13, 21, and 22. It says the Lord was going before them. Okay, so the pillar itself is actually referred to as of the Lord. It says the Lord was in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, but the language there is just interesting. The Lord was going before them in the pillar. So the Lord is in the cloud. He's in the, the, the pillar of cloud. Exodus 14, 19 through 20. Then the angel of the Lord, who was going in front of the Israelite forces. Again, it, it doesn't just say the cloud was going, his power. No, it says the Lord himself was going in front of the Israelite forces. It, he moved. Or the angel of the Lord here. It's referred to as the angel of the Lord. Which, by the way, is one of these great mysteries. And I always find it fascinating that, um, you know, from a Jewish, Muslim, Christian perspective, Christianity has always held that God has revealed himself in a way that leads us to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. And there's no getting around it. The entire Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but Jews have always wrestled with this. They go, well, wait a minute. The angel of the Lord is spoken of as if it is Yahweh himself, but yet it's a visible angel. So it's called an angel, a messenger of Yahweh. Is it Yahweh or not? And they, they kind of conclude, well, yes, it is, but in a sense, it's something that's distinct from Yahweh. Yahweh is on the throne in heaven, you know, Yahweh the Father, Yehovah the Father, and he is unapproachable. The New Testament says he lives in unapproachable light. In John, it says no man has ever seen God, but then it goes on to say God, the only begotten God, who is at the Father's bosom, has revealed him. So the God that sits in heaven, God the Father, has always been a self-revealing God. He's always essentially assumed a form whereby we, with our limited our eyeballs, our, our, our limited abilities, can perceive him, can, can recognize him, can actually see this angel going before the Israelites. And the reason for that 
is because God is, and he always has been, the very essence of who he is, is he is the self-revealing one. He is the one that wants us to know him, and in order for us to know him, he has to essentially veil himself. He has to come down, and that's why you have so many examples throughout the Old Testament. Hagar says, I have now seen the one who sees me. I've seen the one who knows me, who sees me. And of course, he wrestles with Jacob. And you know, so many of he comes down and eats with Abraham. The Lord is constantly showing up. It's very fair to say. It's very reasonable. And it's right to say. Um, as Ron Rhodes talks about in his book, Christ Before the Manger. Great, uh, great book. These are pre-incarnate manifestations of Yehovah the Son, God the Son. These are pre-incarnate manifestations of the one who would later take on flesh and be named Jesus of Nazareth. These are Old Testament appearances of Jesus. He wasn't named Jesus yet, but it is Yahweh the Son. And so the angel of the Lord, the Metatron, is, for all intents and purposes, Yahweh the Son, the self-revealing aspect of Yahweh. So this, this angel of the Lord, the angel of God, was going in front of the Israelite forces. It moved and it went, or he moved and went behind them. Okay. The pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and stood behind them. So it likens the pillar to the angel of the Lord as if they're one and the same. Again, Yahweh's presence. It came between the Egyptian and the Israelite forces. Verse 24, Exodus 14, verse 24. During the morning watch, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian forces from the pillar of fire and cloud. Isn't that just like fascinating? You go, wait a minute. So it describes it as though God is in the cloud like up there, you know, whatever, at cloud level, and he looks down. He looks, you know, like, you go, really? I thought God's everywhere. You know, no, like it describes him as being in the cloud, looking down at the Egyptian forces, and he threw them into confusion. Exodus 19, verses 16 through 17. This is now the theophany. They're now at Sinai. It came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there was thunder and lightning and flashes and a thick cloud settles on the mountain and a very loud trumpet so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. They were terrified. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. To meet God. They didn't just stand in front of thunder and lightning. They came to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. The Hebrew actually says they stood under the mountain because the mountain itself was covered with the cloud, which was the chuppah. It was the, uh, the Lord himself provided the hoopah for what was about to be essentially a betrothal covenant, a betrothal ceremony. Okay, so the, the pillar of cloud that is actually Yahweh himself, his presence, he is in the cloud that's been leading them out of Egypt. He now settles on the mountain in the form of a thick cloud on the mountain, and that represents God's presence. I mean, it actually is the embodiment of Yahweh's presence in their midst. So the point here is you ask any, again, Old Testament literate Jew, how do you know that God is in your midst? How do you know that he's present? And they would say, the pillar. When the pillar is present, when the cloud is present, and it's multiple other times, right? Like when Solomon dedicates the temple, it's filled with a thick cloud and the priests are overwhelmed and they fall down. Like that is evidence of God's presence in their midst. It's, it's the cloud, but it always goes back to the Exodus. Verse 18 through 20. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. So it's fire, it's smoke. Again, very similar to the Abrahamic covenant. A flaming torch in a smoking oven. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Yahweh came down on top of the mountain. And you have all of this sort of phenomena. You've got the smoke, the fire, the blasting of the trumpets, the shaking of the mountain. Everyone's just terrified. But it says that God came down. Again, Christians are always going to say, are always going to talk about the incarnation. We, you know, God dwelt amongst us. Yes, that's amazing. But even Jews have this backstory that says God came down. He showed up. That is the looming mountain at the beginning of the story. Now, as Christians, we kind of put everything on the incarnation. We should put 
the initial sort of foundation for everything at Mount Sinai, and then the incarnation is sort of the next step, but the ultimate focus of redemption, the ultimate focus of yearning and waiting and longing and pointing to throughout the entire Bible, it's not the incarnation. It's not the cross. That's, it's wonderful what happened in the incarnation, that God dwelt amongst us. It's wonderful that he made atonement for us on the cross. But the, 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 the emphasis, the pinnacle of redemption, of this unfolding story of redemption, is not the incarnation. It's his return. Okay, Everything that happened in the past is pointing to that ultimate day. What happened at Mount Sinai when God came down, as it's, as it's described here in Exodus 19, as crazy as, I mean, just life-altering as that was, thunder and the blasting, and they're trembling, as unusual and unique as that was, as majestic and terrifying, that the Bible frames that in such a way that it's intended to be understood as a faint foreshadow, as just a preliminary minor glimpse of the glory that's coming when he returns from heaven on the clouds. The return of Jesus is far more glorious, majestic, and terrifying than even what happened at Mount Sinai. That's how the Bible frames it. Skipping forward a bit, Exodus 33, verses 7 through 8. Now, uh, the Lord gives Moses the instructions to build the tent of meeting, to build the tabernacle. And really, there's a couple different things because at times the tabernacle itself is referred to as the tent of meeting, but there was also another tent, uh, sort of preliminary tent, that's also referred to as the tent of meeting. Uh, they're both sort of referred to as the tent of meeting. But Moses made this tent of meeting, and it's really fascinating because why is it called the tent of meeting? Because that's where he met the Lord. But just this, this passage just blows me away. Exodus 33, 7 through 8. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp. So you had the camp of the Israelites and some, somewhere outside of the camp, Moses used to pitch this tent. It was a good distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent, Listen to this. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, there's Moses, he's walking out to the tent, all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of their own tents, and they would gaze after Moses entered the tent. Why? Why would they gaze? Verse 9 through 10. Whenever Moses entered the tent, as Moses went into the tent of meeting, the pillar of cloud would descend. It would come down from heaven. So think, this probably went on for years. I mean, after they left Sinai, the 40 years of wandering in the desert, you have the tent of meeting. Moses goes out to the tent of meeting. Out from the clouds, from the sky, the pillar would descend and it would come down. Now listen to this. The pillar of cloud would descend and it would stand at the entrance of the tent. So again, I assume it would have been fire at night, cloud by day. And the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and they would worship. So they would stand at the, at the face of their tents with, you know, in, with attention and they would worship. They would look like, think of how surreal that moment had to have been. They're looking and they know that God himself is present visibly. It's not like, you know, we have some wonderful times of worship. We close our eyes, we raise our hands, we envision whatever it is that we're envisioning, we sing to Jesus, right? They did it with their eyes opened, and they saw the fire and the cloud, and they knew that Yahweh was, presence, was present in their midst. But then look at this. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to one of his friends. Just like, someone, like, just like you talk to one of your gal pals or one of your buddies. The Lord would speak to Moses just like someone speaks to one of his buddies speaks to one of his friends. Moses would stand there in the tent of meeting, again with the veil, because the glory was, would actually burn his retinas. I assume it would actually do damage to his eyes. It was too much. And he would talk to God face to face, like someone just talks to one of their friends, through the pillar. It's just a crazy picture. It's a crazy picture. And there's some stuff there um, that I could deviate into and talk about the Mount of Transfiguration and ask some pretty crazy questions, but I won't do that. Later in the New Testament, you've got this picture of Jesus, and he's in glory, and he's talking to who? Moses and Elijah, the only other one that went down there to Mount Sinai. And you kind of wonder the connection there between what happened in the Exodus and what happened at the Mount of Transfiguration as Moses and Elijah were talking to Yahweh the Son. 
the same one, ultimately, that they talked to back in the pillar of cloud. Now, the Christian vision of the return of Jesus, for what it's worth, so we've kind of laid out some of the Old Testament concepts, ideas, and backstory. We're going to continue to do that. But the Christian vision of the return of Jesus is usually, you know, you've kind of got this white, fluffy cloud. You've got this beautiful blue sky. Jesus is returning on a, a nice cumulus cloud, and he's kind of this, again, Caucasian hippie surfer from California, and he's coming down on the clouds, and, you know, he's a gentle shepherd type of thing, and he's going to save us, or, you know... You get some glorious pictures of him riding on a white horse. But, you know, when you look at the iconography, the paintings of Jesus down through history, it's usually like that. It's kind of this white, long-haired Jesus floating down on a cloud in a blue sky. It's a very serene event. Because we look at the, you know, Acts when he ascends from the Mount of Olives. And he goes up to heaven and they're watching him. And, you know, they're like, he goes up into the clouds. It's a very strange picture. And the angel goes, hey, you know, men of Galilee, like, why are you guys sitting there looking up at the clouds? And they said, this Jesus who was taken from you, and you just went up, he's coming back in the same way that you just saw him go up. So if you just look at that passage alone, you know, I understand how you could get that idea that he's just going to float down in the sort of serene fashion. But there's much more to it than that. Again, the whole backstory of the storm clouds, of him coming down in fire and thick clouds and the blasting of trumpets and a mighty earthquake on Mount Sinai. All of that imagery and language is appropriated and applied to the return of Jesus who comes back in storm clouds. Again, remember, what does it say just before? It says, then will come the sign of the Son of Man. It says the sun is going to be black, the moon's going to be blood blood red. I assume that's because the sky is filled with clouds. There's all sorts of disturbances on the earth. It seems like, you know, people can speculate, well, it's a nuclear fallout or this, that. Who knows, right? Like, it's all speculation. But there's some massive disturbance. Uh, we look at examples when there's volcanoes and the clouds fill the sky. The sun is going to go black. The moon is going to turn to blood red. There's some massive celestial disturbances and massive disturbances on the earth. And it's in that that context of storm clouds and thick clouds and doom and gloom. The day of the Lord is always described as a day of thick clouds, doom for the Gentiles. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man. So the return of Jesus, again, all of the language of the Exodus, the thick clouds, the earthquake, the thunder, the lightning, all that is, will be present when Jesus returns. And we can go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. The return of Jesus is something far more terrifying, far more glorious, far more majestic than what happened at Mount Sinai. But there's something a little bit more to it than that. So let's look at how Jesus actually describes his own return. Again, with all of the Old Testament backstory passages that we've just looked at. So you've got Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. Uh, we're just going to touch, touch on one of the verses here. Jesus says, Then they will see the Son of Man. He's alluding, right, to Daniel 7. Then they will see the Baranasha coming in clouds. So Mark says he's coming in clouds, right? Exodus said that the Lord was present in the cloud. Jesus says the Son of Man will come in clouds with power and great glory. Glory, of course, is radiant shining light like the shining forth of the morning sun. In Luke 21, similarly, he describes it similarly, but slightly different language. Mark, he's coming in clouds. Here, he says they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Now, it's a cloud. It's a particular cloud, not just a whole bunch of clouds, but a cloud. He will come in a cloud. Jesus, the Son of Man, the cloud rider, is coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, let's read Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. There is a specific sign that will appear in the sky. It's the covenant sign. Okay, now what's interesting, again, you go all the way back to the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah. The first covenant sign, the Lord says, I will place my bow, my rainbow, in the clouds, and it's a sign. It's a covenant sign, and the covenant. It's it's um it's called oath in Hebrew, pronounced oath, not like O A T H in English, but oath. It's a sign. It's a covenant sign. It's the rainbow, and in many ways, that rainbow is a prefigurement, a foreshadow of 
Yeshua, Jesus, who is the ultimate covenant sign that will be placed in the clouds, right? You can kind of see that connection there. It says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when we read this in English, we think all the peoples of the earth are going to mourn and weep. And that's most likely true to a degree. Those that are recognizing, you know, that they didn't repent, they were on the wrong side, etc., etc. But what's interesting is Jesus is quoting another passage here. He's not just alluding to Daniel 7, the passage about the Son of Man. He uses the term Son of Man multiple times. He's not just alluding to the Yahweh, the cloud rider, Deuteronomy 33, Psalm 68. He's not just alluding to those Yahweh is the cloud rider passages. There's no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides on the clouds. Sing to Yahweh, sing praise of his name. Sing to him who rides on the clouds. He's not just alluding to those. He's, Jesus here is also quoting Zechariah chapter 12. And this is so important that we add this in, because if we don't recognize this, that we just read this in English, we just think, yeah, all the peoples of the earth will mourn. But the original context of the passage, again, that any first century Jew would have been very familiar with, it tells a little bit of a slightly different story. And then it goes on, by the way, it says he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. They will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. As we've said uh, before in last session, that's the rapture, okay? This is when Jesus returns visibly. That's exactly when Paul says we will receive relief. It's after the falling away, after the revealing of uh, the man of lawlessness and this type of thing, after the, re after the tribulation, as Jesus says. And uh, likewise, actually, before we look at Zechariah, not only does Jesus... Um, allude to Zechariah in the Olivet Discourse, but also in Revelation 1, verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds. Again, cloud rider language, son of man, Daniel 7, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be, amen. Another reference to Zechariah 12. Matthew 24 alludes to it, but also here in talking about the return of Jesus, alludes to Zechariah 12. So now let's read Zechariah 12. Let's read the original text that is being referenced. Okay, again, we know Daniel 7, we know Deuteronomy 33, Psalm 68. Zechariah 12 is a critical text that helps us to understand the return of Jesus. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. Okay, a spirit of grace and repentance on the house of David and the residence of Jerusalem. Well, it says the whole earth will mourn. Yes, in the English, in the New Testament, it says all the peoples of the earth will mourn. But it's quoting Zechariah 12, which says the original context is the house of David and the residence of Jerusalem, the Jerusalemites. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. When Jesus returns, we're all familiar with this, right? The residence of Jerusalem, the house of David, will look upon the one they pierce, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, weep bitterly for him. Again, so when it says all the inhabitants of the earth will mourn, or all the tribes of the earth will mourn, the original context is the tribes of Israel, the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be great, as it was back in the morning of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. They will, the land will mourn, every family by itself. It goes on, the family of David's house the family of Nathan's house, the family of Levi's house. This is a very Israel-centric passage. So you ask the question, what will it be, as a Christian or a Messianic Jew, what would it be about the return of Jesus that would cause all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jews, the house of David, the house of Nathan, the house of Levi, what would cause them to recognize that this is the one that they pierced. How would they recognize that this is Yahweh? Is it that they're going to look at him and go, oh, wow, that's Jesus. That's the guy that we've seen in all of the Christian paintings and icons. That's the Caucasian hippie that all those crazy Gentiles have been talking about for the past 2,000 years. It's not that like they're just going to recognize him because they know what he looks like. Oh, yeah, I saw the movie. I saw Jesus Christ, you know, Franco Zeffirelli or the Gospel of... It's not because they're going to recognize a guy with long hair and a beard type of thing. Not that there's any consistency with the way that Christians have portrayed him. 
it's not like they're just going to recognize him. There's going to be something specifically that causes the Jews, the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem, to recognize that this is indeed Yahweh, the cloud rider, the one that was promised. And I would present to you, with all of the backstory, understanding that the, the primary manifestation throughout Israel's history that reveals to them that Yahweh is present is the pillar of cloud. And in the same way that when Moses would go into the tent of meeting and the pillar would descend from heaven and they would stand in worship, I would present to you that the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is indeed just that, that when Israel's back is against the wall, at one minute to midnight, you know, when there's none left, slave or free, when there's, you know, very few inhabitants left, their back is against the wall, the, the Antichrist is about to win. Israel thinks all hope is lost. The darkest hour, the pillar will descend. In all of the cosmic signs, the sun goes black, the moon turns red. Like they're familiar with those things. It's referenced in Joel and Isaiah, etc., etc. The pillar will descend. And there will be a very distinctly Jewish nature to the return of Jesus, if you will. On the other hand, there's also something distinctly, I'll say Christian, although it's not Christian, it's biblical, about his return is that he will come in the form of a man. He will appear to be a human. And in that sense, the Jews would say, oh, that's what the crazy Gentiles have been talking about in that he took on the form of a man. And so there's something there that will cause the Jews to recognize that, of course, those that are believers, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. We will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye, as well as all of the faithfuls of old will come up out of the earth and, and uh, meet him in the air. Okay, so it's not like we'll have any difficulty recognizing him. But it's interesting that when you, you, you envision the return of Jesus, it's actually something that will be recognized by Jews specifically, so much so that it will cause them to repent, to recognize him, to recognize him. They will look upon him and the spirit of grace and supplication and repentance, and they will mourn and weep, and the spirit of uh, salvation will be poured out upon Israel. The history of the Christian church and the Jewish community is really 2,000 years of reactionary theology. These guys believe this, therefore we believe just the opposite. Christians believe this, therefore we believe. And there's sort of this ever-growing uh, schism, and I find it fascinating in so many ways that when you really do look at the passages that speak of the return of Jesus, you look at the way Jesus describes his own return. You know, like when he says, coming on the clouds, what clouds? It's not like it's just like a surfboard skimming through the sky. No, when Yahweh was present among Israel, it was specifically in the form of the pillar of cloud. And in all likelihood, that is how it would have been understood. That's how it most likely would have been envisioned. And I just find that fascinating. It's a different way to envision the return of Jesus. Again, we can't say it dogmatically, but I think it makes sense. And I think it's pretty cool. And I thought you all would think it's cool as well. So I'm actually just going to leave it there. Um, we could talk about a few more things, but I'm going to leave it right there. Next week, we're going to continue um, in the text, in the book of Revelation. Uh, I hope you did enjoy the session. I hope it was a treat. As I said last week, the return of Jesus is everything that we're longing for, that we're hoping for, that we're yearning for, that we're panting for, that we're patiently waiting for. It's everything. That's the day when everything makes sense. It's the day of justice. It's the day of relief. And so, therefore, I think personally that we should talk about it more. We should chew on it more and even speculate about it a little bit more. That's okay, as long as we acknowledge that it's speculation. I like getting lost, our imagination, envisioning his return, fixing our hope fully on that day, our blessed hope, the anchor of hope for our souls. So amen and amen. Um, with that, God bless. Trust that you all have a blessed week. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, Maranatha.